Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Very Vegan Holidays. Uh, we're going to take off the hold screen here in just a minute. And I'm so excited to uh, to get this event started. Um, our very first chef for Very Vegan Holidays is the wonderful Hannah Kaminsky, who is a Bay Area favorite, who recently moved to Austin, and we all miss her very much. We miss you, Hannah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this morning and being our first chef for Very Vegan Holidays. I'm super excited to see what you have for us today. And, um, and then we'll do some uh, Q&A afterwards. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. My gosh, I miss you guys so much in the Bay Area. Uh, I hope you can see me okay, hear me okay. I will admit I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, technical issues over here, but I'm just going to keep talking to myself and pretend like that's all cool. Um, get my attention, like wave like something is on fire if, if it is. But yeah, I'm really excited to be here and share this with you despite any distance. Um, today, I am going to share holiday Hanukkah staple latkes. So I have to admit that at first, I wasn't planning to make any latkes this year because it's just me by myself. Um, kind of sucks to make a big batch of fried potatoes for just one person, especially considering all of the mess and hassle of deep frying. But I realized I've got this air fryer. So why not make a small batch in the air fryer, which is easier, healthier. I mean, win-win all around. And then that way I can still enjoy for myself. So God tell you, <laughs> a week before this demo was planned, my air fryer died. I have about one day of experience with this new model, so if it doesn't quite turn out, um, you know, the results will still be delicious. And you can also make this in your oven if you don't have one. I was trying that first. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get there. So this is totally inauthentic, you know, DIY version, super lazy, super easy. And to kick that off, I am starting with hash browns. I am not even going to shred them from scratch because honestly, I find that to be so annoying. Even if everyone can hear me okay, I'm really sorry. Um, I don't know what I can do about that. I'll try to, I will definitely send you notes, recipe after this if it's an issue. Oh, good, good. Thank you. I can read the text at least. Um, so, like I was saying, starting with hash browns. You can get these either these are refrigerated or frozen. And if you're using frozen, just thaw them in advance, squeeze out any liquid. If you want to start from scratch, you can also shred your own potatoes. And um, just again, the enemy of a good latke is water. So you want to squeeze them really, really well, drain them really well. And um, so, yep. We're just starting with this is a 20 ounce bag that's one pound, four ounces. And I love these because they're super dry to begin with. And dryness ensures a good sear, which makes good crispy results. And I mean, that's key for a lot of Lock is very, depending on who's making them, whatever you grew up with is always the best. Not going to take it away from you. But I always had really, really thin, really, really crispy ones. So that's what I'm always going after. I like them a little bit thicker than my parents would make, so that they're like crispy on the outside, but sort of tender, creamy on the inside, like a good French fry, but better because, I mean, it's a latke. Nothing makes pizza latke. So to that, I am going to make a slurry that will help bind them all together. And I need another bowl. To make my slurry, I'm going to use starch and you could also use potato starch if that is handy to you not a big deal and that will be a quarter cup and to get the best measurement you always want to spoon it not scoop it because that packs it down and you're looking much more than you would want i mean for the most accuracy always get a kitchen scale but i know not everyone has one just put on your wish list hope that the um Ma mystery maccabee will buy it for you or the secret Santa. We've got a quarter cup. And to that, everyone's favorite egg replacer. 
<laughs> so I always save it. Every time I open the can of chickpeas, I just save all the liquid. Always end up using it. And that is equal measures, four to cup. And we'll blend that really well. So it's sort of like a paste. And yes, also air fryers are amazing. They do so much more than just excellent latkes. Again, if you've got a wish list going, definitely put that one on. And there are tons of great deals online right now. Can't lie, online shopping, 2020, Tad's year. <laughs> also, before you go buy one new, hit up like Nextdoor or Craigslist. People are pretty much giving them away, I to say. So we've got this nice little paste, delicious. Not yet, but it will be. For seasoning our potatoes, I'm again gonna be extremely lazy. Instead of chopping the onion, I've got dried onion flakes. I mean, why not? Make it easier on yourself. That's what I'm saying this year. If you're just cooking for one or two, make it easy. So I've got a tablespoon, get that on in. Salt, essential, about three quarters of a teaspoon. And black pepper. I would say to taste, but like an eighth or a quarter teaspoon if you really want to measure. And that's it. And so we are going to add the slurry into the potatoes and mix it all together. Just wanna make sure everything is coated and incorporated nice and smooth. So just to prime you on the air fryer while I'm stirring, I have an air fryer oven type model, so it's got racks to use. Um, the lower cost and Previously more common was the basket type, which you can use as well, but you can only, you can't do as many at once because the racks allow you to stack them in there. So just be aware, it might take a little bit longer to do them in batches, but it all works. All right, nice and even. And it still looks like potatoes. Not a big transformation yet. So we're gonna get our racks over here. And I have lined them simply with uh, parchment paper. You could also use aluminum foil. I've just torn it to roughly fit the shape. You can buy ready-made parchment paper specifically to fit your air fryer model, but I find that kind of unnecessary. It's just harder to get. You'd have to special order it. And it's a lot more expensive for a thing that you're gonna use once and throw away. So use what you got, cut it to fit, and that's very easy. And so I've got a neutral spray oil. Since we're not gonna deep fry, we're still gonna be pretty generous with this, but it's easier for even coating and using less. Using a basket, do you need to line? Yes, you still want to line your basket and spray that as well, because you don't want to stick, and you do want some of that nice, you know, savory, crispy, fatty flavor. Um, kokumi is what they call it in Japanese, the, the, the flavor of fat, which sounds kind of gross, which it doesn't translate well, but it is a, a richness that is a, a sensation. So spray that evenly. I want to mention, I've got avocado oil here, which is my favorite, but you could use your favorite oil, avocado, um, rice bran, grapeseed, canola, olive oil, of course, very common. So a nice, nice even layer. And now I'm going to take my ice cream scoop. Could also be a large cookie scoop. Um, you could also just, you know, portion out with spoons, but I like this for consistency. It's about three to four tablespoons. And I'm going to take the mixture and really pack it in as well as I can. And sort of like gather it into the edges. You don't want too much hanging over the sides because those bits will burn and get that down onto your prepared sheets. And so the nice thing about this is that unlike cookies, they won't rise or spread, and you can tack them in pretty close. 
I am going to do about six per sheet for mine. Um, yours might be a little bit smaller, mine's kind of big. I've got the new, not the new wave. Don't buy the new wave. I had a new wave arrive to replace the broken one and it didn't work at all. So sorry. Um, this one is the Instant Pot model and it, it's very spacious. So far, happy, one day in, ask me another week. <laughs> But yeah, there's a ton out there. It doesn't have to be name brand anything. They generally work all the same. Um, it's think of it more like a mini oven than like a deep fryer because it works as a superheated convection oven, which is why you can also use a standard convection oven. Uh, this one we're going to set to 375 on the air fryer. But if you want to bake in the oven, I would just do it at 400 or so and a little bit longer. So these guys are gonna bake for about 15 minutes in the air fryer. If you stick them in the oven, a conventional oven, I would aim for 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. And so just to show you, um, we're gonna press it down pretty, pretty flat. See, oh, you can see it better that way, I hope. So about a quarter or an eighth of inch thick, as thin as you can go comfortably. Get them pretty even so they cook evenly. It's not just about aesthetics, although that helps. And you know, it's okay. I don't even mind if they're touching. If they bake together, I'll cut them apart with a knife. Because again, it's, you know, just for me. It's not a big deal. Being consistent is the most important part. Okay. Look something like that. Wash my hands. And then I'm just going to spray the top with more oil. So it gets nice and crispy on top as well. That's all it takes. So we're gonna pretend that I did this one. <laughs> And just start with one for right now. So if you didn't have racks or you didn't have enough racks, just do it in batches. Um, you can do two at a time, but I wouldn't do more than that. And we're gonna bring over the air fryer back here. Starting on the top rack, if you have two, top and bottom. and set that for 15 minutes. And I'm gonna flip it about halfway through. By flip it, I mean rotate the sheet. So top to bottom, bottom to top, very easy. But it's not latkes without toppings. The most common ones are applesauce and sour cream. So I am more of a savory person than a sweet person when it comes to my latkes, believe it or not. So I always go for the sour cream. And what was really special that my parents always did was, you know, it's a holiday. They go all out and celebrate. They get out the caviar to go on top. So today I'm gonna make a cashew sour cream and lentil caviar. I'm super excited about this. Again, extremely easy. I'm gonna take our blender, got a Vitamix. A uh, high-speed blender is preferable. It will make things smoother and easier. You can use anything you've got if you don't mind the texture. Uh, food processor is also fine. Just take your time, let it blend nice and long. First staple is cashews. These guys have been soaking overnight. Um, you could do as little as two to three hours, or if you completely forget, all is not lost, just boil it in hot water for about 15 minutes. And we're gonna drain that thoroughly. Over here, and let's Great. That's a couple of cashews. Raw, should specify. Should specify. Because it wouldn't be the worst thing if it had that toasty, nutty flavor, but we want it to be a little bit more neutral here. And to that, I am going to add plain, unsweetened yogurt. This one is coconut. You could use any alternative that you prefer. I know there's cashew, soy, I don't even know anymore. There's so many out there, which is great. Rural development. So I'm gonna add a half a cup. 
Um, spoon would be better, but we're going to make this work. And there are also lots of great ready-made vegan cashew, uh, not cashew, but sour cream is on the market now. I know Forager does one. Um, Tofuti is the classic. I don't know, guys, show them out. What's your favorite sour cream? Help me here. I haven't bought vegan sour cream in a while. I think Kaiyoba's one. They're all good. Okay, so we got about half cup. about a quarter teaspoon, you can adjust and ramp up. And apple syrup vinegar, very simple. And you could use any fairly neutral vinegar that you want. Uh, rice vinegar is great, white vinegar is fine. Uh, coconut vinegar is fine. I wouldn't do anything too heavy like a red wine or balsamic, yeah. Um, just keep it pretty simple, just for a little bit of tang. You can also use lemon juice if you like. And for that, I'm going to do a tablespoon. That's a little piece. And so now I'm going to blend this off camera. Hopefully it's not too loud. So I'm going to talk louder. Hopefully you can hear me. I'll need to blend for a minute or two. Um, and while that's going, I'm going to get the lentil started. Tablespoon of vinegar. One tablespoon. So lentil caviar. Of course. The key here is using the right lentils. Uh, there are tons of lentils out there, I love them all. But here we've got black lentils, which are also known as beluga lentils because they look like beluga caviar, of course. Love these things. I make this small batch because if you're thinking of it as actual caviar, you don't need a ton to go on. I mean, you wouldn't just like throw spoonfuls of it on your lot. Just a garnish. I mean, I might, but I mean. So that we're going to use three quarters of a cup of water. And the secret ingredient that will make this not fishy but oceanic, because it's that sort of briny flavor, is blue. Uh, you can get this at specialty stores. I think they sell this in different days, and it comes in like really big chunks. So you don't need a ton. I'm going to break off a piece. And this is super rough. It's not important how much. Plop it in. And to that, I'm going to season it with a tablespoon of aminos. You can also use coconut aminos. I think. This is soy, so coconut if you want soy break. And two teaspoons of balsamic vinegar for a nice little twangy kick. And because caviar is pretty salty, I'm going to add a little bit more salt. Now that happens.
perfect. So just like that, our cashew sour cream is done. How nice it is. Like so. Super happy with this. I love it because it's got that sort of twangy kick to it, but it's not aggressively sour or vinegary. It's just lovely. And if you want, you can thin this out and use it like a cooking cream too. So that's going to go bring it to a boil, the lentils. And um, when it gets to a boil, reduce the heat to a simmer cover. And like I said, 15 to 20 minutes, 15 to 25 to 30. My apologies. 25 to 30 minutes until the lentils are tender and there might still be a little bit of liquid left over and you can just drain that off, not a big deal. I would chill that before serving for best results. So that's gonna take longer than we have. Let's get right now. When it's done, it looks like this. Love this stuff. I would just throw this on salads, anything you want. Fair mind's about salty, but I think that's a great thing. And we're gonna check on lettuce. We're gonna think that we're getting some nice browning on the top. We want it to be a bit more even and golden all over, so this is a good time. I'd move it down to the bottom. And if there was one on the bottom, that one up to the top. But because we don't have time for that to fully cook, when it's done. Something like this. Voila. And so you just serve it up with your toppings. Happy Monica. So. Wow. That is absolutely stunning. Oh my God. Thank you. And I'm, I'm so happy that I had this opportunity to think of an alternative to the deep fried traditional latkes because I. I want to be able to celebrate too. I just don't want to go through all the rigmarole for one. So everyone should have holidays. Everyone, everyone should have latkes. <laughs> latkes for everybody. <laughs> exactly. So I'd love to take questions if anyone had any. Yes, definitely. Let's let's get some questions going, folks. Let me turn off the air for right now so I can hear you better too. <laughs> Where did you find that uh, that particular kind of lentil, that beluga lentil? The lentils? Yes. They're just whole foods. So whole foods brand. Very simple. Right on. And how long are those cooked for again? It's about 25 to 30 minutes. I never would have thought to make a caviar substitute out of lentils. That is so clever. That's exactly why... You're one of my favorite chefs in the world. You always come up with these amazing, clever things that honestly, I nobody ever, it's just amazing the things that you come up with. I'm always impressed with your recipes and I love, love, love your cooking demos. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, it's, I mean, I feel silly sharing this because it's all so simple. These are like four ingredient recipes each, but I think that's kind of the best sort of food, the things that you'll actually make, right? Exactly. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be taking you all day to make something wonderful and delicious. It's, and it shouldn't take every single ingredient, <laughs> like 25 ingredients to make something right. nice and, all and delicious. Right. All the ingredients in your pantry, you got to go out and special order things. It's so simple. And I also want to say the one real specialty ingredient, the kombu, you could also use uh, seaweed snacks. They sell those at Trader Joe's, like, you know, the little packets, the salt and oh, yeah. things. Throw a few of those squares in and then strain out the end. Same effect. Yeah, you get the little bit of a uh, of sea seaweed uh, fishy flavor and and you're good to go. And those really are available everywhere. Yeah. And also if you got an Asian market, they're like pennies per piece. Actually, that's a really good good idea, good tip because 
the Asian market is also where you can get so many other wonderful vegan items. If, if you have a, a, an Asian grocery in your neighborhood, patronize them. They are wonderful. Big, big time. I love, I'm, I just found MT Market here in Austin. It's a little bit up north. It's a vegan wonderland. Oh my gosh. The types, the varieties, the scopes of tofu alone. There's like a whole tofu aisle. It's amazing. Oh my gosh. An entire aisle of tofu. That's like tofu heaven. <laughs> serious, serious. It's crazy, the stuff out there. So, I mean, what's safe? Definitely explore your city a bit more and if you're not the smaller businesses. And that's honestly, that's a good message just across the board, especially right now. It's the, the small family owned independent businesses that are really hardest hit by this pandemic. So when you can, it's always best to support the independent and family owned businesses instead of going to the big chains. Yeah. It's an important thing to keep in mind for that for holiday shopping too. Oh, 100%. Oh. And that doesn't necessarily mean shopping in person, too. You can, even, you can still shop online, locally, safely. That's so true. That's tr so true because, uh, you know, we don't want anybody exposing themselves unnecessarily to this awful virus. I hope everybody's staying safe out there and wearing your masks and washing your hands and staying home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. It breaks my heart. But so happy that I can join you virtually and I'm so, in a way happy that it's sort of breaking down those barriers that makes it possible for all of us to be together virtually a lot easier now. I, I agree. I thank goodness for Zoom and thank goodness for social media. I think that's exactly what's keeping us sane right now and keeping our community active and, and supporting each other. And I just want to uh, draw everybody's attention to Aaron popped a link to Hannah's, uh, Hannah's bittersweet blog in the chat. So please visit Hannah's website. It's amazing. You can find so many delicious recipes there. And uh, she has a ton of amazing books too. She's got a brand new one coming out on May 4th of next year, uh, all about vegan ice creams. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I am super excited. This one has been a long time in the works. I've uh, gotten really slowed down with COVID and all, but I'm hoping that by the time it comes out in May 2021, I can come and visit and we can have a real ice cream social. So this is my second ice cream book, actually, but more than just plain scoops, which are great. I'm also focusing on novelties and cakes and things to do with melted ice cream, baking with ice cream. And I just love thinking of it as a whole different sort of medium. It's a lot of fun to play. And it's important to have fun with your food. <laughs> yes, I think number one, like if you're not enjoying it, it should be a full experience. It's not just fuel. I actually never really was a big chef until I became vegan. And it was the challenge of um, trying to veganize all of my favorite things that really made me um, excited about cooking. And then I discovered all these amazing vegan chefs like you and learned a whole bunch of tricks and and it's just, it's the most fun thing, I think, discovering um, how to veganize holiday classics, traditional favorites. It's just so fun. And I really, really deeply thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us today, Hannah. Well, thank you for making it possible. I'm really happy to share and connect. We hard. love you so I much. Being in Austin, just moved here, don't know too many people. So I really appreciate having that online community more than ever. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I hope that you'll join us again in the near future for another cooking show. Definitely. Happy to. And I can't wait to see what everyone else is making. Me too. This is going to be so much fun. I think this entire series is going to be awesome. I'm just so excited about our amazing lineup of chefs. And thank you for kicking us off today, Hannah. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Chef <laughs> Nina, are you ready? I am, uh, yep. <laughs> Excellent. Let me get in frame. <laughs> it's okay. I can entertain everybody with uh, my little co-host, Mr. Monty here, who's decided that he must sit in my lap right now. <laughs> no, I'm in frame. Oh, here you are. Hi. Can you see me? Hi. <laughs> I'm doing the, 
You look fabulous as always. It's so Is nice to okay? see you. I've got so much going on here. I'm like, okay. But I also want to make sure you can see more. I mean, I'll put it up here so people don't just, and then I'll tilt it. I just want to see how far. I think that's good. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I love those glasses. Thank you. Have the how best about shirt. my speakers? I These love it. These are whisk takers. <laughs> you always have the best t-shirts. <laughs> I have to say, I am absolutely so excited about this recipe. I've been, oh. I've been just, as soon as you sent me that photo, my mouth started watering. I absolutely cannot wait to hear all about it. I'm so excited. I don't know how to do that. I like... I'm so excited about it too, but I'll tell the story. So I don't know. Are you all on? So. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and hand over the wheels to you and then I'll pop in with questions later. All right, good morning everyone, wherever you're at. I don't know, it might not be morning for everyone or early afternoon, but I'm so excited to be here with you. We are in full bloom in the holidays. And you can see if you didn't before, vegan bakers, although I'm not baking today, kind of sorta, are whisk takers. So my whole life has been a whisk taking. I've realized I've been saying it wrong. It's not risk, it's whisk taking. So thank you for joining us. Our meal today is inspired from a trip that I took to Senegal in the early part of 2017. I had started working with this ancient grain called fonio which is a West African grain. It's been harvested for over 5,000 years and it's very drought um, sustainable, meaning it grows anywhere and, and it's just a very strong ancient grain. It's really a seed. Um, its nutritional profile would probably be compared to quinoa and then some as far as just the nutrient density of this grain. The women in um, West Africa, as with many things, you know, have hand, I'll say processed it, because I don't think process is a bad word when you take it from harvest and then you make it so that one can cook with it, but it is a lengthy process. So now with technology, some things have improved, but it's about, I don't know if you can see that really well. It looks like sand, but it's about 1,000 times smaller than a grain of millet, if that puts it in perspective for you. It's really nice, though, because you can use it in any dish that you might choose to use uh, rice. Um, you, you could replace it for uh, polenta or grit, so it can be used in pilaf in stews. And today we are doing a Senegalese jollof Fonio. Jollof is a West African dish. It's a rice stew. So you'll see the ingredients that we're using today. But in South Senegal, they use fonio. So I'm not just making things up. I, I traveled, like I said, in 2017 to Senegal for a two week culinary excursion. It was hosted by the West African Research Association. So we did have lectures every morning with regards to the history of West Africa. We were in Dakar, but they really covered West Africa. We talked about just the temperance of the country, religion, because it's mainly um, Muslim there. We traveled across the country, uh, Senegal, and really studied um, how things are harvested. We learned the history of the experts in rice agriculture. And we did go to Gory Island and it was, it was a bit for me, but I wanted to go and experience where, you know, um, some of the slave ships went in, but I think it's really important the history I learned. These Senegalese people were known to be proficient in rice agriculture. So when you get into the Americas, um, we need to do our history about where and what the contribution has been 
to rice agriculture here. But today I'm gonna to use Fonio. I really love it. I will make it like grits. I'll have it in the morning. You can use it as a porridge. So you might take it more to the sweet flavor profile. And then I like to use it in a savory profile. But then I've combined, cause we made jollof. A lot of the dishes are based with jollof. And of course, based on um, their sea there, there was a lot of fish but they really accommodated me and everything that was made that I partaked in was vegan, plant-based. And so often as it is, when we made table dean, which is the national dish of Senegal, and the difference is they would put fish on it or whatever meat of choice, but typically fish, mine or the one I worked on didn't have that. And I worked with all these women in the kitchen and they were just so wonderful. And they'd start early in the day, we'd have our lecture session and then we'd go and cook or we'd be traveling. And sometimes one time we spent the night. So we had lecture where we were at this resort where there was a female co-op and they were harvesting honey and just really, really beautiful to see the people are beautiful. Um, and then I learned this rich history of the relationship between Vietnam and Senegal and soldiers, Senegalese soldiers went into Vietnam. And so then that part of the history, cause there's a large part. So I'm gonna keep it narrow for the time I have. Of course they brought back, not of course, but they brought back Vietnamese wives. So now you see this blending, this melding of flavor profiles of different techniques. Hence why the next part of the dish is um, Vietnamese style char siu. And I'm using a large king oyster mushroom. Typically this would be used or this style and technique of cooking would be done with roast, sometimes chicken. People can make variations, but because king mushrooms, especially for those, or if you're trying to serve a dish to someone that's a meat eater and they need that texture, right? And I find when I work with king oyster mushrooms, I can re really deliver that and, and the flavor profile, but that texture of the meat and when you first bite into it. So I'm braising these. Often char siu will be grilled and um, then we go from there. So let's get into it. Because this is slow cooking, I needed to get started earlier. And I've got several ingredients that I'm going to tilt my camera so we can put the focus on the food and you'll hear my voice as we go. So let's do that. So we're gonna start off with the jolofonio. And there's a couple of things that are standard. And then just like if you were in maybe India and you talked about curries, it would really be dependent on the area that you were in of India, whether it was North, South, East, West, and the family's contribution. So in this jollof, we're gonna start with sauteing onions. I've just diced, you can slice a yellow onion. I've got a mixture of red and yellow bell pepper. I've got carrots diced. And I also have, I like to use stewed tomatoes, but you could use plum tomatoes just, uh, or vine ripe ripened tomatoes, but I like the juice of the stew. We do have tomato paste, so you can see this flavor profile is really a tomato um, based dish. We have uh, peas, and that could be optional, but most of what we did in Senegal had peas in it. Now, I didn't go, well, actually there weren't any scotch bonnet peppers um, where I went to shop. When I was traveling and, and doing uh, my certification in comedic yoga in Jamaica, when we go to get food, Scotch bonnets were all over. And as well as in Senegal, because we went to a different market every morning, outdoor market, like our farmer's market here, but just massive. It was like a full on store, just all the um, suppliers would bring all of their stuff very fresh. I've got sea salt, this is Himalayan. Your choice of salt is fine, using about two tastes, right? I've got black pepper and I've got garlic. So um, the jalapeno for me is replacing the scotch bonnet 
and scotch bonnets, if you've ever worked with them, are quite hot. So what I learned and how we made things in Senegal, they wouldn't dice up necessarily the scotch bonnet. We put it in things whole. Like we put it in the tomato, the base we were making whole. And you got this great aromatic flavor and taste and the heat, but not so intense. So I find sometimes the translations of food when it gets to the Americas is, you know, maybe dicing it up like this. Now I did remove the seeds out of this jalapeno. So that makes it also more palatable for people that don't like really spicy things. And the seeds are where the heat is truly contained. And I like to enjoy my food. I don't like feeling like my mouth is on fire and then I can't taste anything. So I'm going to, we also used a bay leaf. I actually use two. I like to get fresh bay leaves whenever I can. And um, where I shop, they're readily available, but you can also use dry bay leaves. So I'm gonna bring over what I've already been stewing, hence the name stewing to, you know, this is not um, fast cooking, right? So then I started with, everyone see that nicely? I started here with my onions, my bell pepper, my carrots. I put my peas in last. I went ahead and I got my, um, and I'm gonna take those out now. Always remember to take them out. No one really wants to chew on a bay leaf. I mean, I guess there's that one person in the world, right? There's always someone that will say, I wanna chew on that. But if you could just smell it, it's so aromatic. Now, what we're then going to go along and do with this to make the jollof fonio. So we got that down. We have the tomatoes, the stewed or plum tomatoes you put in it. You have your tomato paste, you have your salt, you have your pepper. I put a little garlic, as I said, right? Then I'm going to come and take my fonio. So fonio, um, this is a Yolele uh, brand that I just order. I now just saw that it's in Whole Foods. So it's uh, becoming more readily available. And when I traveled to Senegal for this culinary excursion, Chef Pierre Tiam, who is the ambassador of West African culinary um, efforts, he led it. And this is his product. I like to make that disclaimer. I have no attachment or financial benefit from it. I had started working with Fonio in 2016, as I said, which led me to find this culinary excursion in Senegal. And I was getting product that was very grainy. It didn't really have instructions how best to cook it. It's a very small grain. So how do you wash it, right? And then when I did the research and um, knew of Chef Pierre Tiam, then it was like, oh, this conversation started with Fonio. So you can see this is one and a half cup of Fonio to one cup of water. So it really yields well because now I have two cups from one half dry Fonio. I've got two whole cups. The recipe that I originally worked with was for uh, four cups, but you are serving a larger amount of people. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our stew element here and we're gonna fold in our Fonio. I like to fold it in um, just so you don't get any clumps because it really fluffs nicely. But, you know, sometimes just fold things in so you can get a nice coating versus putting in the whole two cups and then it kind of clumps on you. You can do it like that. It smells so wonderful. My nose is beginning to pick up on everything and kind of clear out. Ah. So let's do that. Is anybody hungry yet? It's the challenge here with demos is not a challenge. It's really fun that we can do this in the season that we're in, but I love to see the faces and I always love to demo and have you taste the product. Now I will make this and, you know, serve it hot. Like it's ready to go now. I can put it on the plate now and we're ready to go. But for me, when I'm prepping it, like I made it last Sunday, 
and I had, because I'm eating by myself, um, by choice, uh, <laughs> I had it and every day or every other day that I ate it because I can just grab it, warm it and just go on. It just blooms that much more. If you could just smell it right now and then as the days progress in the week, it just has this wonderful, delicious flavor um, that, yeah, it's really nice. So you could see that this, Joloff Bonio, the Senegalese Joloff Bonio, you could use with so many other things. You could have tofu eggs and, and put it with it. You could put it in a burrito. We talked about wraps last time. I could probably, I know I could put it in the collard green wrap I did and switch up the things with the lettuce base and avocado. So there's so many different purposes or repurposing of this that I love. It holds well. So if I make a batch like this today, it holds for me quite well for a week. And what I'll do, I'll batch it out in smaller containers. So I'm just grabbing what I'm using and heating that because it's easy for me to do for myself. And you know, people think, oh, you work in a kitchen all day and I'm still in the commercial kitchen, our, our, our kitchen at Venice Health. But when you've cooked all day and we're doing, uh, people are coming curbside and picking up meals for four or our veg out boxes which are like csa boxes you don't i don't necessarily want to come home and start this huge meal after i cooked all day and i love to cook so we're just going to put this on the stove back on the stove for a minute and keep it warm okay so that's ready to go you're ready to um dish that on your plate and fonio, a cup of fonio is about uh, three grams of protein. It's gluten-free. It has a very dense profile of vitamins and minerals, and you can go Google it, F-O-N-I-O, F-O-N-I-O, and really learn about it. And I would recommend it's something that we start adding into our um, food source and what we're eating. We're gonna move to then our next dish, our complement dish. You know, in, in the plant-based world and through the Thanksgiving holidays, I was listening to different podcasts and watching different lives and everyone would be talking about, oh, what sides are you going to have? And they would start talking about the vegetables. And I'm thinking, that's not the side, that's the main attraction. So the fonio to me is that main attraction. And then even the mushroom is that complement. But nothing's a side. It's very intentional in its thought. And I think that's the difference. Whether you're plant-based, vegan, or just wanting to have more meatless days, or just more vegetables on your plate and you still have a little bit of animal flesh, Let's stop thinking about it as a second side thought. It's a first thought. It's um, vegetables we need for digestion and fiber and protein and minerals and vitamins and all those things we know, but I will sound like a broken record until we really start to get it. So here I have my um, king oyster mushroom. I did take off the head because I, I want this part. I want this part because I'm going to braise it and you'll see that in a minute. And then I'm going to cut it and then we're going to put that on the plate. But the important thing, I've wiped it down and cleaned it. I've cut off the base, just shaved that a little bit. And my ones I braised are larger, you'll see that. But they, you know, after braising, they're gonna shrink down. The nice thing here, braising usually is really, really slow cooking, right? But with your mushrooms, you only really need to braise for about 20 minutes. And so you're going to take this, but you want to fork it. You want to get holes in it because mushrooms are wonderful as a sponge to pick up all of your flavors that you're working with. So I'm going to put the holes in this. And then I'm going to, um, when we talk about char chou and, and then the braising, we've got the different ingredients that we're using. And then the technique is the braising. And that's, I first, and I'll show you that, I first take the five um, season, Chinese season, and that's your cinnamon, your fennel, your star anise, your um, black pepper, and your cloves, and that's ground up. And you can get those and make your own if you like or it's readily available in the store. So then I take uh, about a tablespoon of 
sesame seed oil. I have my sesame seed oil here that I put in the pot. I did use a bay leaf again. I then use my Szechuan pepper. This is a ginger turmeric um, blend that I like to use. And then this is my five spice. So I put the uh, oil in, I put the bay leaf in, and then I just for about two minutes stirred the saute, brought up the aroma till I could smell it. And then I went in with my mushrooms and they're very tender. They've taken on that red color a lot of times. Um, char chou, the meat is very red, but often that's artificial coloring that they've added to get that bright red, which I'm not looking for. Um, this works very well for me. So once I go in and you're kind of just searing those in the braising process, I then went ahead and I added um, soy sauce or tamari for your gluten-free if you like, and you can get low sodium, obviously. I then did um, ohaisen sauce. I'm not trying to make that from scratch. There's some really great brands out there. Unless you just have time all day to do that, I don't. I have maple syrup, about a tablespoon, that's optional. And then I'm using a black bean fermented sauce because this is really going to give this that umami, mushrooms already have a lot of umami flavor, right? So that is that flavor we lean into when we're used to eating meat, one, but mushrooms and other um, eggplant and some of our other vegetables have a lot of umami already to them, but these beans are going to also, and they're fermented, anything fermented of the legume source is going to have a lot of umami and that really satiates us. So I then just kind of deglaze the pan after I um, had sauteed these mushrooms. And all I mean by that is I went ahead and put about a fourth cup of water. I put a tablespoon of rice wine and I added the um, soy sauce the fermented black beans and the hoisin. So here then is what we get. And you do have, and I could have even um, braised it down a little more, but I, I kept the pot on because I like this juice. And I'll take this juice and I will put it in a container and then drizzle that over things. So let's see what we've got here. I'm just gonna take two of these. I'm going to save that third one because I always love the fact that I eat whatever I make for you guys after I'm off camera. I'm just going to move a few things over. Don't spill everything, Nina. Let's do that. Let's wipe that up. Are we hungry yet? It's so quiet out there. I need some music. And I'm just going to go ahead, much like you you might be used to with um, your meat. I want to just slice this about half inch. It's so juicy and it smells so good and it's so tender. You could bake these also. I just love braising. Um, and because it's not such a long process if, as if you had something that was much thicker and you'd need more time. And then look at how those slices really have gotten all of the juice filtered in. And that's why you want to you know, make sure you've poked your holes in so the juice can get in. So you're not just tasting it on the outside. And then when you bite through the mushroom, it's just this bland kind of experience. That's not what we're looking for. And I think, you know, everything with regards to technique and intention of really making sure that mouth, that bite you take and the, um, just the whole experience is so important. I'm going to transfer this and then I'll move it into frame onto my plate on top the fonio, and then I'm going to just take this and I'll show you in just a moment what we've done here. And I'm gonna slice that there. 
and get all this up. I don't like to lose any of the juices. Um, no, one second, I'm sorry. I love, even when it's just me, I really love um, making the plate look good. I, and Christy knows this about me. I think everything is about how food looks on the plate. I also, burn your hand, Nina. I took some pearl onions because I think they're so delicious and they just add so much to um, this dish for me. I'm just going to, and just, I just put them in the oven on about 375 and, you know, oven roasted them, if you will. You could add a leafy green to this dish. I don't like to just um, overpower it. I get so much leafy greens in my diet that I'm okay if it's not on this dish. And then I'm going to just woo, carefully. Yeah, I didn't do that. Just mold it like that hand, free hand. Okay, so you just <laughs> saw that. <laughs> I'm going to take some mock root uh, lime leaves. They're very citrusy and used a lot in South Asian dishes. And just kind of, I've just chiffonaded it. And we're going to just drop that. It's a little thick there. And then I want to just take, I, I love just edible flowers that you eat, they're edible. Anytime we put anything on a dish, you should feel confident that um, you can eat it. But I love to just really pretty up my food because we eat with our eyes first. And so I present to you my Senegalese, Jolofonio with your carrots, peas, onions, tomato base as traditionally made. And then our um, king oyster mushroom char siu with our pearled roasted onions and just some petal flowers. You know, sometimes when you're using flowers, we may have a tendency just to plop that whole thing. It's a, it's a little clunky to me. So I just like to peel off a petal and if you pull gently they'll just come out and then you just place that you don't need a lot working on uneven numbers as you go do what you like but just sharing some ideas so there we have it i'm going to eat this but not on camera <laughs> <laughs> that is so absolutely gorgeous yes wow Oh, and obviously yes. you don't have to put it in a mold, but you know where my mind works and presentation is everything. And if you are coming to my house for this for dinner, or you're coming into the Vitalize Cafe, we are going to, yes, this is art to me. This is working on a plate like an artist would use maybe their paints with their palette. So I love this and I, I, I put a lot of love and passion. Those of you out there that know me, you know, um, people say, well, why'd you become a chef? Because I like to eat. And <laughs> I started my vegan journey when I was bodybuilding. So it's now been over 20 years, but this is what I present to you. And I can't wait for the time when we will open back up. I know it's important right now for us to do our due diligence, wear our mask, flatten the situation so we can get back out to letting those of us in the culinary world feed you food to live for, not to die for, food to live for the way we love to. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chef Nina. That is absolutely so beautiful. And everybody, everybody in the audience is just wow. Everybody is saying how amazing it looks. Could you describe the beautiful smell to us? Because I wish we had, as somebody said, I wish we had smell of vision because that looks like it smells amazing. It does. Well, imagine having first the fonio. So you've got that tomato, very aromatic. You've got your onions. You've got that. I did put jalapeno. You've got the bell pepper and you know those flavors. So you know a great stew that you would make. So first of all, you have that aromatic um, 
aroma wafting right up under my nose right now. And then with the char chou, I've got then fermented, right? It has that very kind of pungent, but it's sweet and sour with the hoisin and the maple syrup oh. and the soy. And then you've just got that braising down. So now you've got this umami, very earthy, very earthy, sweet and salty is the best I can describe. If you were to take a, a taste of black bean ferment it'd be mm. very deep in its flavor and its depth and it just makes your mind kind of go what the heck is going on here <laughs> but it's so delicious i i hope i yeah i can't wait till we have smell of vision oh it's you know that's really what we need that's what we yeah. need right now so uh you know anybody out there in the tech world who's watching right now get on this like yeah. we need this right 20 away years ago i was saying why don't we have smell of vision <laughs> we're so smart and then the answer <laughs> i got was well if you're so smart chef nina figure it out <laughs> I, I haven't had the time <laughs> <laughs> we we've had several requests uh in the chat would we be able would you be willing to share the recipe with us of course of course oh. christy I'll, I'll make it available to you i just need to type it up you know i i get a vision i get an idea and it's so interesting and anybody in music may be able to relate it's like i taste a note on my tongue oh, that's I, I don't beautiful. Know how else to describe it. i taste i wake up in the middle of the night i'll be like oh my gosh i have to try this now i knew Senegalese jollof that I made. And then I knew the concept of wanting to bring the uh, king oyster mushroom in, but I needed to find that intersection um, for me to bring them together. So when you take a bite, when you break into this phonio, let's do that. Okay, here we go. Like, okay, right. When you break into that, when you get this fork full of mushroom and then you get this phonio um, and then you've got this, uh, flower petal in there when you take that bite oh, i want it to be a amazing. symphony in your mouth i want you to go whoa what's i want your brain to go what the heck <laughs> i don't want you to start picking apart oh i taste this and i taste that mm -mm. i want it to be such a melding of flavors and mouthfeel and for your brain to go wow that texture i know but oh my gosh my body's doing something different. I'm feeling different. I'm not tired after I eat. I feel very energized and I feel full of vitality. So there is a science to this. So with that, I get an idea and then I get in the kitchen and start testing. And often, you know, you have your first revision, your second revision, sometimes your third, because these are two dishes that are already done and components and I'm not starting 100% from scratch. I knew where, oh, I need a little bit of ginger, the gingers, and I forgot gingers in here. And I showed you that, the turmeric and the ginger. So you've got that warmth and that heat of those, the five spices and then the ginger that's just warming your body. And in this season, it just feels so good, not temperature wise, not the heat of the dish by the heat on the stove or in the oven. I'm talking about the the temperature of the spices, the temperature of the jalapeno, the temperature. So when I was raw vegan, people would say, oh, well, and, and traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic would say your body, well, excuse me, especially traditional Chinese medicine would say, ah, that's too damp. It's gonna cause problems with your spleen. No, you had to know how to use the spices because heat, temperature wise, does not heat the body. It doesn't. It's heat in your mouth, then your body quickly makes that body temperature capable so you can swallow it. The things that heat our body, that increase circulation, that help with the lymphatic system are the heat that's contained in our spices and our herbs. So that's where you really want to key in and understand flavor profile. And when you're learning a cuisine, if you like Italian or you like Mexican, or you like um, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, Senegalese, um, West African, let me say, I, I, I'm a little partial because I went to Senegal and I love Senegal and I'm going back. But that's what you want to get into, especially in a plant-based diet. You want to dive into flavor because you have, I've said this before, a lot of plants that are full of water. And so people 
spice and season like they normally would. And that's not going to cut it because you've got all this water exuding out, especially if you don't sweat your heavily water containing vegetables like eggplant and zucchini and squashes. You're going to get this puddle of water in all your efforts in a recipe using the amount of seasoning or spices that they say are going to be watered down. And that's why I think typically, I think, People will say, oh, plant-based food is so bland. Well, I come from a kitchen with my mom since eight years old and my dad is a culinary um, trained chef and then me going to two different culinary schools and we dove into flavor and profile. So when I say I'm making a Mexican dish, a Mexican inspired dish, I'm going to use those flavor profiles. When I say I'm gonna make an Asian, South Asian, and that's a lot of different countries, just like India, South India, North India, cook very different. You get into Africa, the largest continent, even within West Africa, you've got so many different profiles from that region. So do a little bit of research when you get a recipe and start thinking based on what you're making, whether it's Italian or French, what is it that we're using and why? And then when you get into fusion, when you take a Senegalese and a Vietnamese concept, then you know how to intersect those things because there is usually in that sense, a crossover in some of the spices because they've inspired the companies, the, excuse me, the countries have inspired each other. Does that help? But yes, I'll make the recipes available. I'm gonna get this out of my face right now because I'm gonna eat it. <laughs> I'm too tempted. Are you still with me? I can't hear you on this side. Ah, there we go. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, this little one was uh, screaming. I knew to wait a minute or you tell me. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yes, it did. And, uh, and I loved your description of it as a symphony because it's so, it's so true. All of these different flavor notes coming together to create this amazing symphony in your mouth. It's just and like, that, even that looks amazing. I want to lick that right now. Yeah, right. And I'm going to sop it up and put it back in my sauce. I'm not <laughs> rinsing this down the drain. This is a clean board. And most people would just rinse this down. No, we're going to get the knife and or my uh, spatula, and I'm just gonna go ahead. I don't, we're a no waste kitchen at Adventist Health and in my kitchen, cause that's what I'm used to. So you can repurpose things. You can put different things to the fonio. You can take the mushroom and add them with more leafy green vegetables or even green vegetables. That mushroom dish would taste wonderful, like on um, right now, butternut squash or acorn mm. roasted or kabocha, um, a Japanese squash, it's so delicious. So I like dishes that are very multi-purpose. So through I my that. if I make the fonio, I can add it to more things. Like I'll saute some kale or I love collards, you know that. And I'll just saute that and have that. I have a full meal. I don't need to add anything else to get protein. I've got protein. Oh yeah, there's protein all over the and all over. Fonio, what a fascinating grain. I've never even heard of Fonio. And yes, it's and let me show you. And I'll I'll send you the information, but it's um Y O L E L E foods.com. Y O L E L E foods.com. And look at it's just so, it, it's like sand. Oh, like I wow. show you, it's such a small grain. Imagine 1,000 times smaller wow. than a grain, a grain of millet. That is just, that's just fascinating. And that it yields so much from so little. So little. So it's oh. very economical. It's yeah. very economical. It starts to make sense. And it's been around 5,000 years. And that one bag has so many meals in it. This one bag will give, uh, let's see, it's uh, it, the recommended serving is one fourth cup. So in that two cups that I made or what yielded two cups for me, that would be what, eight servings? Is that right? One fourth, yeah. yeah. That would be already eight servings. So it says about six servings per container, but based on the recommended yield, I'm getting a lot more out of that. When I first made this dish, 
I made um, one cup. I used one cup of Fonio to um, two cups of water, half cup, one cup. Yes. And I got four cups of, I got, Fonio was going all over the place in my kitchen. Wow. That's just amazing. That's just amazing. And there's, there's still folks asking about the, don't worry, folks. We'll 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 share the recipe in the future. I'll make sure everybody knows Let's about see, it. I will make sure I get the recipes to you latest Thank tomorrow, you. and then we can post them because I just need to transpose them. I have a notepad that I write my amounts and such down, and then I go over and tinker with it, and then I come back and go, no, I need a half teaspoon of the five spice. I want three quarters teaspoon of the ginger. And that's really off of my palate, my palate. I like a lot of depth of flavor. I like things to pop. So when oh, you get yeah. a recipe of mine, when you get a recipe of mine, if you're not a high level flavor, punch me in the face kind of person, use half, use half the recommended amount, the suggested amount, and taste as you go. We can always add. It's hard to extract. That's such a good tip. That's such an important tip. And I loved what you mentioned about uh, adjusting the spice levels too, and and taking those seeds out. If you if you're somebody who doesn't want something that's super super spicy, take those seeds out and and bring that heat right down. And if you try or if you experiment with Scotch bonnet, as I said. Everywhere else I've traveled and Scotch bonnet was a popular thing. We cut it up, diced it up, sliced it up. Um, when I got to Senegal, we did not do that. We took the whole rinsed Scotch bonnet and put it in the pot. Woo! Third, and we just let all the flavor exude out of that. We never cut it. And then we removed it out like I did the bay leaves. And that just was like, for me. That's and you can do that with jalapeno, you could do that with poblano, you could do that with so many things, especially if you're a little sensitive, but you'd like to experience some of the flavors, do not cut it. Make sure it's washed, just pop it in your dish like you would your bay leaf, and just let the sails of the pepper just kind of exude out into your flavor. It'll be very mild very aromatic it'll be like notes in a song like even in a fragrance the different notes the top note the middle note the bass note and it'll just be a whole different experience to food one and you know this christy and most of you that know me i cook food i cook food i choose ingredients that are free of any animal flesh or animal byproduct but the first thing i do is i cook food, food to live for. And we need to get to this place of understanding that. So when someone comes in our cafe and says, oh, is that the fake cheese? No, that's the dairy free cheese. Most people have lost their ability to tolerate and digest lactose and dairy at the age of three. And there are some countries and people in Asia and Africa that have less of a tolerance, but it's not good for any of us because cow milk the, um, I'm forgetting the name right now because I'm so excited, has shown to cause liver cancer. So let's be kind to each other. Let's be understandable and compassionate. But I lean into people when I think they want to do a dig and say, oh, that's the fake. Nothing's fake. Do you know the process of making cheese? <laughs> <laughs> you just need a milk and you need to understand exactly. which milk you're using. And then the it, we wouldn't put in, but there's other things we can do for plant-based. So it's such a rich, rich, I mean, culinary and food is such a history lesson, one. And then it's such a beautiful, um, when I'm in my kitchen, I put my music on, I'm just in a meditative space. I'm thinking about, you know, just being able to feed people. One, my dad's going to say, make sure it's delicious. And two, don't get a big head, Nina. Go back to the drawing board when they tell you it is <laughs> delicious. And then three, automatically it's nutritious because we're making slow food. We're making it from scratch. We're not eating junk food, which you can be a junk food vegan eater. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. So thank you. Oh, so healthy and delicious. And we, we had a question. Would you be able to substitute other kinds of mushrooms instead yes. of the king mushroom? 
If you don't want to do the king mushroom and understand why I did the king mushroom, because if you uh, imagine roast, <laughs> it's not just this mushroom when I cut it, you know, um, it, it and I cross cut it and it lays down. If you could see the plate, I don't know if it's transferring as well on the camera. It kind of looks the color and all of the roast. So if you're feeding someone mm -hmm. that's trying to transition, I don't need that, but I am considerate of that when I'm trying to introduce people to transitioning and then the texture. Now, what's the next mushroom that's going to probably be the best to do this with? It's probably a portobello. Probably a oh, yeah. But a portobello has a different density than a uh, king oyster. So I want to try and take um, something heavy a skillet, a cast iron skillet in the kitchen, we have weights like we do with our tofu. I want to press oh, yeah. some of that moisture out. I want to press the moisture out one. Mushrooms already are a house sponge that absorb, but I still put holes in this. So we'd still do that with the portobello, right? But I probably want to press some of that moisture out. So then when I'm braising it, it really picks that up. And then when you dry something out, it has more texture, right? So you have to think about when you're just shifting. Yes, you could do portobello, but then there's another technique to get as close to what I'm sharing with you in this recipe that calls for oyster mushroom. There's gonna be a different mouthful from oyster mushroom to portobello mushroom if you don't really know how to, or you don't think about getting that same texture. And that's the other thing. There's a lot of ways we can switch out but then what do you have to do when you switch it out to get the same concept, the inspiration and the idea that the recipe creator had when they made this dish, when I taste that dish and I want to then relate that to you, it can shift. The other thing you could do with that kind of concept would be um, oyster mushrooms, not the king, the oyster. Uh, you could probably do this with, but it's gonna be maybe a little bit harder to find Mm, uh, the lion's mane. And you're going to get oh, a yeah. kind of pulled pork texture with the lion's mane, but it would be delicious. And it has less water than, say, a portobello. So there's so much to when you line up the different mushrooms that you can use, they're not all the same. They're not just different in shape, they're different in t density and moisture and texture. So the thought process is somewhat bringing you or I'm trying to get as close as I can to you with what you're <laughs> used to if you're a meat eater, if you're trying to eat less meat. If you get over here to me that's a vegan, you just want flavor maybe and, and maybe you're not worried about the texture, but it still needs to feel good in your mouth. Does that make sense? Oh, definitely. And what, what great ideas for substitutions too. You can go and experiment. Yes. And then, you know, just try, try new things, find what, what works for you. And that's, you know, that's what I love about your recipes too, is you always suggest like a couple other substitutions and, and what you can do for different uh, mouthfeel, different flavor profiles. That's, it's just so exciting. I just absolutely adore working with you, Nina. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. One more thing. If you do the portobello after you've done everything, if you don't want to press it out, just after you've braised it, do slice it on the bias. Slice it yes. slice, not just break it down. Cross, slice it on the bias. And then maybe just sear it a little bit in the skillet. Just last minute, sear it, four minutes, four minutes, three minutes to four minutes, and then you're done. I just needed to calculate that in my head to make it easy for you. And you're like, what's she talking about weights and presses? <laughs> that's such a good idea. And, and the, the pressing idea, that's what a great tip because well, we I know that with like, food, right? you need to know that press is an important part of any vegan kitchen. And like, I have, I have my impromptu tofu press where I have a plate yeah. and I put my yeah. big bag of rice. on. <laughs> yes. And I have a tofu press, but you can use whatever <laughs> works for you. You don't have to get all crazy with the gadgets. I'm a gadget girl. So oh, yeah. I'll get them, but I like to see what they do. But tofu would be another option, but you need firm, yeah. extra firm tofu. You really need to press it. You want to place those holes in it and then just, you know, do the same thing and braise it. And it'll be delicious if you're, if you do tofu, if you eat tofu, that's another option.
that's a really good idea. That's a really good idea. And you could try to kind of change what, what the dish is about. And this is such an interesting fusion of yes. two exciting cuisines. I love that about this recipe too. And it's a fusion that when you go to Senegal, you see Vietnamese restaurants, you see restaurants, uh, Senegalese restaurants that have v Vietnamese fusion dishes. I just didn't take one continent and went over to another and said, I mean, you can't do that. But I am doing this from my studies of being there and seeing what was going on. And I just did not know of the connection between Senegal and Vietnam especially in the food thing. And then there's a whole nother history and, and political and religious everything. It's just fascinating. I feel like, I feel like I've gone, not only did I, did I learn how to make an amazing dish, but I feel like I've gone on a little trip around the world and gotten a history lesson at the same time. Well, isn't that the way? I mean, we can't really do those things that we're used to doing. I'm used to flying all over in my work and I always make pleasure out of it. So I do love food for that. I do love food for that. And I wish our kids could during history class in the seventh grade, I took French and our French teacher, we had a French day and I'll never forget it. And it had such a huge impact because I at one time wanted to be a French interpreter and work at the United Nations. And we each had to bring a French dish. And I, the sweet tooth that I am, had my mom find a recipe that we could make that was a three layer cho French chocolate cake. My friend, Lisa, her family is French. They made uh, escargots. The, the oh, first yeah. time I tried escargots and that was enough. They had that garlic bread with, I was sopping it up because that, whatever was in my mouth, I was like, I don't know what this is. And I was in the seventh grade. When I got to France, I did try before I was vegan, escargots again and it was the same thing. Nope, I'm done. Thank you, I've tried it. No, thank you. <laughs> and um, so that class, where we had the culture, we had the music, we had some dress, culture dress, right? Not modern. And then the food, it had such an impact and there's things that just locked in my brain. So when I did start traveling to France and I, through work, have gone there many times, things pop up for me when I get there from that seventh grade class. So I thank that teacher to this day. I didn't become a French interpreter. I, I think I did something more um, expansive for me, for me and my personality and my character, but it had such a huge impact. I, I would dream of having kids um, have culinary history in school. That would be absolutely fascinating. And, and I think it would allow kids to, I know that so many parents complain about kids only wanting to eat uh, and even vegan kids, like uh, the chicken nuggets or the vegan equivalent, the, the, the faux chicken nuggets are, are just like fries or, you know, like mac and cheese and that kind of thing. If, if kids were exposed to a, more of a breadth of uh, culinary options, you wouldn't see that. You wouldn't see kids just refusing to eat anything but mac and cheese. <laughs> and, and kids are open to it because I worked with food literacy. We were second year in the food literacy chef championship. Collard Greens won. We won chef oh, championship yeah. this year. And these kids are first to sixth grade. And they have every week lessons. And they were getting the boxes of each chef, what we made. They got those ingredients. And you get the kids in the prime starting at first grade. I mean, I was at eight holding a knife and you know doing things obviously use safety and, and guidance, but they want to learn spiralizing zucchini noodles. They're not gonna say, I don't want this when they're involved in it and you give them a good marinara, a really good sauce. And then you make walnut. If there's a nut issue, there's other ways to go. You can do mushrooms and you can do chickpea, but you start involving them in it. You know, they took home ec out of school, like, hello, how do these kids survive? They don't know how to cook. And if their families eat out four times or more a week, that's what they think is what we do. So. Yeah, that's so true. Thank you so very much for joining Thank us again, you, Stephanie. Everyone. I, I really, really appreciate it. This was so exciting. I know from the comments in the chat that our audience really, really enjoyed it. And I, you, I hope you have a great holiday season. And I hope we get to work together again very soon. Yes, thank you everyone. And really think about what you're having on your plate. Make it delicious. 
but <laughs> also be conscientious of everything else we know that I won't bore you with. But thank you so much, San Francisco Veg Society, for having me again and the audience that's come in. Please go to my page at Botanical Chef on IG. Ask me any questions at Botanical Chef from this because the learning doesn't stop here. It's just beginning. So reach out to me, reach out to Christy with questions. She'll get them to me and I'll get the recipe to her by tomorrow and then she'll post it as she sees fit. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Chef Nina. Happy holidays. Bye. You too, <laughs> bye.